Hi, and welcome to Drafting Compliance. I'm Kane, he's Tom, and we talked about the key challenges when first starting the journey to ATO last time. Today, we're talking about system and information integrity. But before we get to that, we have some beers. What are we drinking today, Tom? Yeah, this is, I'm actually pretty excited about this because I've not had many Japanese lager, and that's what this is. It's by Freem. Freem, yes. Freem, Freem down in Hood River, Oregon, where my yeah, buddy so, Cody and I went on a ski trip for a uh, fairly rainy weekend, and he saw exactly how much beer he could pour into me in three days. <laughs> well, what's interesting to me is that there's a Japanese lager coming out of Oregon. But uh, mm -hmm. um, So, you know, I have had a Japanese lager. I can't remember the name of it, but most of your uh, hibachis have, have such a thing. And, okay. you know, they're they're generally pretty light. So I'm going to assume it's a pretty light and sort of almost champagne-y kind of beer. So I'm, I'm excited by it. It has a really cool Sounding sort of um, kind of old world black looking can, which is cool. Yeah, it's kind of got some texture to the label here, too. It's yeah. hard to show it on camera, but it's got a it's it feels like this red label was added in post. Yeah, I think the other so. thing I'll say is that at Freem, I remember they had a pretty good brewery down there. They had an outdoor seating area with big fire pit. And uh, I remember the food was pretty good, too, just overlooking the Hood River. Probably a better oh. place to go in the summer to watch the wakeboarders and paddle surfers and uh, you know kite surfers out there. But we were there in the dead of winter where it just decided to rain on us continually. Well, I would say that good food at breweries is not the norm. It's probably the exception. So that's a good thing. Cool, cool. All right. Well, let's crack Are we going to try opening this Heck up and yeah. see how it goes? Okay. Fair enough. Fair, fair. Yeah, it's already got sort that's of that a very smell. faint, yeah. faint smell. Oh, my goodness. I can probably see. This is almost white. Yeah. Okay. It's clear. Oh, it's yellowish, actually. Yeah, okay. Now I'm going to make it fit. It's got some... It's got bubbles. It's very, yeah, very it light. It's it's way lighter than little the little bubbles. It's very, very light. It's much lighter than the camera picks up. Yeah. Um, this is you know Bud Light light in terms of color. Aren't it's they one of the better. cursed brands these days? Aren't they having a marketing problem? Yeah, it's a silly marketing problem, but they are having a marketing problem. Uh, okay. Well, we will not have that. Instead, we'll just have Japanese lager which uh what's the abv on this one tom lately we've been having some fairly high i think it's five percent if i'm not mistaken okay look. fantastic yeah, 5%, you, should right to, on the... you should be able to shotgun this one right now and we'll be fine for the rest <laughs> well, of the let's, episode let's smell it i i took a quick breath it, it, i tell uh, you it oh, hold on i no, i, I, I want to have a go first because no, you, you go. okay otherwise you are going to put your thumb on this and i will have an opinion based on what you said all right um i'm kind of smelling some a little bit of grapefruit and uh, um, maybe wheat, maybe wheat, or uh, what's the other thing? It's beer, hops. I know beer. Um, that's kind of all that's coming through. There's not a lot else coming through in terms of my. But what are you picking up? I'm picking up a little different. I my my first smell was very bready, like heavy bready, so almost like uh, you just cracked open a fresh, you know, crusty loaf. Mm, and then I'm getting. I, I get in, a little bit of plum kind of scent underneath there. I mean, it's plum. it's faint. Huh. I was drinking some wine last night that had a, a bit of a plum cherry taste with some vanilla, but uh, I'm not getting well, plum off this. I'm going to taste this. We'll see how it tastes. Very similar to... Uh, what I had anticipated is certainly to the the last Japanese lager I had. Extremely drinkable, like it's a little creamier than I had expected. Kind of tastes like misspent teenage years, honestly, more than <laughs> anything else. Uh, I I mean, if you're not a beer drinker, I would think this would go down pretty easy. This is oh, this is sort of the Michelob Ultra of craft beer. <laughs> just dropping all the mass names on this all of those are big brands i imagine tom hmm. yeah i mean there's not there's nothing offensive in this beer it's very easy to drink it's very you you know american pilsner like um very light pilsner it is pretty though. thin it's very it thin. Is pretty thin actually it's not offensive it doesn't have awesome. um you know some other beers that this that kind of look and 
in uh, mm, but it's pour like this would be like a Stella. It does not have the the flavor characteristics of like a Stella or similar. So this is very, very light, very unoffensive, very easy to drink. You know, I think when I was in the Netherlands, I they were serving something like this, but it came in like shot glasses because it had to be kept cold. I don't remember what that was, but we were at a disco. Anyway, um, it was cold. Didn't taste like much. Better. You know what a disco is, Tom. <laughs> I do, but the, in 2023, I don't hear the term disco all that often. So Well, was fine. Just... It was La Discotheque, so there you oh, go. Okay. <laughs> Fancy, right? But we're not just talking about di- beers and dancing, though. Actually, I think that could be great content for some other channel. Instead, we're talking about FedRAMP Moderate. And, um, Tom, I wanted to start by asking about the challenges that our team has faced so far in really maintaining the integrity of systems and information while complying with the FedRAMP Moderate requirements. Yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, this this family of controls is another sort of catch-all, right? It's all about like, how do you maintain the integrity of systems and data? Um, how do you detect unauthorized changes and you know those kinds of things around it? So a lot of what is in this family of controls are simple best practices that most organizations have already sort of wrapped their arms around on some way or other. And the same is here. There's certainly some gotchas or or, or things that um, you know we have to change in our own uh, in our own space because of the language of FedRAMP here. Um, you know they they dial in pretty tightly on firmware. I would say most organizations don't do a great job on firmware. So um, if you're if you're not uh, updating firmware and keeping an eye out on firmware, that's going to catch you here. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly caught us. I mean, in, in terms of of our change process and our in our update process, firmware is somewhere on the hey we we should check this once a year, right? That was traditional. Um, we're mm-hmm. going to do this much more stringently going forward. It's going to be a monthly check on firmware. So um, that's a big change. Certainly the the automation that is suggested and required in this uh, family of controls is also a challenge for us. Um, you know, smaller companies, automation is, has not been, you know, sort of top of the budget. Um, mm-hmm. Now with FedRAMP, we certainly are putting automation where we can. Um, so be, be aware that in this family, automation can be a challenge. Is the firmware requirement because of the kind of a, the twofold fear of either interdiction of uh, motherboards and other components being shipped to the United States combined with the typically rather garbage update processes that most uh, IoT and motherboards actually have, where, you know, HTTPS and uh, man in the middle attacks were never even a consideration? Is that what's driving it? Yeah, certainly that's driving it. Also, there have been vulnerabilities that have been found at the BIOS level. <laughs> Of course, um, yes. In firmware levels, right? So um, just just overcoming the idea that this is a blind spot in most organizations, I think, is the, the intent of this um, this smaller subset of controls underneath this family. But I think mm-hmm. we can agree that, you know, never updating firmware is just a bad practice. So <laughs> I think this is a... Yeah, I, I think, think that's a fairly good thing. Yeah, I don't Although think I think also there... Ask. There are definitely risks of uh, firmware that can only be updated by, you know, dropping it in the wood chipper and buying a new one. Ultimately, oh, yeah, I've seen systems bricked during firmware updates. There's no doubt about it. Now, the good news yeah. in our in our um, sort of implementation, there's not a lot of firmware to worry about. Um, we're we're dealing with virtual machines sitting on top of hardware we don't own, so we don't have to mm-hmm. we don't have to deal with that firmware. This is the right. firmware piece for us is largely you know laptop based. So that's oh, that would make sense for those laptops that actually access the FedRAMP environment. You got it. All right. Well, I want to talk about um, implementation a little bit more. So how has the implementation of the system and information integrity controls really affected or impacted our overall cybersecurity posture at, at Hyperproof under FedRAP Moderate? Yeah, like any of these control families, we are uh, we are finding the gaps in our, in our current deployments and we're fixing those gaps and we're maturing our security posture. So every one of these families we go through significantly matures our posture. It takes what I think are pretty good best practices and adds that extra ounce of maturity on top of it, right? Of diligence around it. So there's not been a huge, especially in this control plan, there's not been a huge gotcha in terms of implementation. You know, IDS and IPS is part of this control family. Azure has a has built-in features in their firewall. You know, we we chose to up it a little bit in terms of 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 
how we can get data out of that um, and not just leave it to Azure. But those things are built um, pretty seamlessly into the Azure stack. I'm sure they are into the AWS stack as well. So those of us that are lucky enough to live in the cloud, um, we have our downsides with it, but we also have our upsides. And some of these easier services to consume are those upsides. So you know, a lot of the pieces in, in, in um, kind of fits that you have in legacy environments, we don't have those problems here. We have. Oh, I can see that. Yeah, we're yeah, not we, having to engineer security into something that was not correctly designed. Sorry, that's opinionated, but yeah. I can be opinionated, right? And something that's not been designed correctly with security in mind. Well, I would say, in uh, you know, to soften that blow a little, Kane, I would say that you know, when you're talking about legacy enterprise folks that have have literally maybe grown from mainframes, maybe they were paper in the in the beginning, right? And they'd grown through mm-hmm, the mainframe mm-hmm. phase and. And suddenly somebody brought Novell in and then somebody brought Microsoft in and they, oh, oh goodness. Hey, look this at is this like Active throwback Directory, Thursday, right? buddy. But, but these, Here we go. We got Novell <laughs> mainframes and the discotheque. But these, <laughs> the, but these sort of legacy installs have a very organic feel, right? Oh, and goodness, yes. you just have so much you have to overcome. We didn't have that problem. Um, we had a, a really a four year build um, that we had to look at and say, how can we improve upon what was already really best practice from the get go? All right. And and just thinking of that, how are we really balancing the need for those robust controls around system and information integrity with our ongoing operational demands and the typical resource constraints you see in a cloud environment? Yeah, that's a good question. So like many folks that that are going through FedRAMP, we are building two environments, right? So mm-hmm. um, our gov environment is getting all the attention, but you know, it would be silly to go through this process and not let it influence your commercial implementation as well. So we are certainly doing that. So there are, I would say the philosophy is these are company-wide controls until there's a convincing reason we can't do those controls in the commercial side. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are things that we don't implement on commercial because it simply would, would hinder the commercial implementation. But in general, we're trying to implement across the organization these controls. So that does create a challenge in terms of, uh, you know, we run on a three week sprint. So all of this implementation has to get sort of shoehorned into these three week sprints with us. But we did some early upfront planning and and those things are going smoothly. So we have um, largely uh, deployed the things in both commercial and and, um, gov environments that are required for this family. So I'd say we're balancing it really well. Cool. All right. Well, I want to ask you about some specific controls, if, if I can. Is that okay if sure. I ask you? To, okay. So uh, I just want to start at the top. So SI1, which is the System and Integrity policy. Uh, yeah. integrity Policy and Procedures. Um, what challenges have you really encountered with enforcement of those? So like every control family, you know, the, the number one requirement is you have to have policy and and you have to have associated procedure. Policy is easy. Us information mm-hmm. security guys can write policy in our sleep. We know it. We know that we ultimately aren't the ones that have to comply to most policy. It's it's the operational groups that do. That's always mm-hmm. the challenge. You know, here at Hyperproof, all of our procedures are sort of bulleted out in Confluence, which is really easy to consume for the engineering group. Not so easy to consume for auditors and things like that. So one of the challenges is to to look at our procedure as it was built and say, okay, is this really what we're doing? Which largely we've done that, and then put it into a format that is consumable by auditors because we know that's coming, right? So that's been a challenge. But I would say after an initial education sort of process that we had to do to make sure everybody sort of understood what is the lift with FedRAMP. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the engineering operations groups, they're coming right along. You know, they're, they're not putting up a fight. They're asking good questions and they're getting the work done. And, but that's, that, that's kind of just across the board. Anything specific in system information protection or uh, integrity or not so uh, much? You, you know, the, I think I probably covered the, the biggest challenge and that's, hey, we've got to figure out the firmware piece of this. We understood already, um, you know, logging and we understood this a big chunk of this is logging. We understood the need mm-hmm. for IPS, IDS. Um, so that was already in the works. We do vulnerability scanning. You know, So a lot of the, the pieces that are critical to this, um, they're already in place. So it's really about documenting what's in place is, is the challenge. 
Fantastic. And if you're enjoying this conversation on YouTube, ring the bell to get notifications about my quest to find literally any beer that's drinkable, or subscribe to this in your podcast app of choice to make the show part of your routine. Now, Tom, how are we addressing SI3, which is malicious code uh, protection, particularly in the context of the increasing number and sophistication of malware threats these days? Yeah, well, you certainly want to have malware protection that is bringing in capable intelligent feeds, right? So we do that. Um, you know, we have a, we have a, um, uh, server based and laptop based AV protection. Um, it's good. It pulls in feeds. It's automated, everything good at, about it. Where we had a gap was in containers. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you were to follow, the rational thought processes around containers, you'd say you don't really need AV inside of containers because it sits at the, it already sits at the the base layer. Right. But clearly with FedRAMP, we have to have it in the container. So we are going through the processes currently to get that same protection inside of containers, really looking at it from a different perspective, right? We, we want to have capable reporting and visibility, but we don't necessarily want to have it making rash decisions inside of containers. C containers are a different sort of environment than like a server is, right? Yeah, so, yeah, I could see that uh, totally. That that approach gives us some caution on what product and, and process we choose to, to implement, but we're we're getting there. So that's a, I that's can a, imagine also that companies with Kubernetes must be struggling with this one. That's us. Yep, we, we are largely Okay, so that's Kubernetes. our specific implementation. Okay, yep. all right, all right. Wasn't sure if that was us specifically. All right. Well, let's move on to, um, I don't know, how about SI5, which is security alerts, advisories, and directives. Um, how are we actually keeping abreast of and responding to the latest security alerts and advisories in a timely manner? Yeah, I, I said the words uh, in the last topic we talked about, right? We've got to have good intelligent feeds, mm -hmm. intelligence feeds. So. You know, we, we, we have a SIM provider, and our SIM provider has inputs for um, multiple intelligence feeds. And the idea there is the the sum of all the parts is greater than the one, right? So we can pull intelligence from their overall network of, of detection capabilities and anomalies and, and get quicker uh, rule sets implemented in our own environment to, see, to face emerging threats wherever they may be. You know, for those of you who don't, um, necessarily have a a set of feeds that that um, you use today. There is a bunch of really good free um, intelligence feeds out there. I go out and peruse them all the time. You know, just go do a Google search and you'll come up with them. Um, I look yeah. at Abuse. Um, Cisco Umbrella puts one out. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a bunch of really good feeds out there for intelligence, um, including whitelists. So if you're looking to how to build your whitelist. Um, those exist out there as well, free, free and available. Uh, just make sure you're you're pulling them from reputable sources. Yeah, I think that's the key there, and also to not confuse um, what we call threat intelligence with actual threat intelligence, because what you're buying is like if you're paying for a feed, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, personal thing in there, um, yeah. because that has to have additional human intelligence typically applied to it to make any kind of determination as to whether or not it's legit, because otherwise it's just data, right? And you need analysts to actually work on it, right? That that's right. I I, I would preface a little differently. You're going to buy product, um, you know, you're going to buy a SIM solution that will generally come with an intelligence feed built into it from their larger installed base. So you're essentially mm -hmm. paying for it as part of your product line. But that's still I mean, for a separate differentiated yeah. one, it's not part of the base product. I think that is I think that feed, though, is really important to include because what you're what you're what you're getting, is like, say you use, oh, I don't know, Splunk. You're getting the entire install base of Splunk and the intelligence that is being drafted off of that entire install base. That's really mm -hmm. powerful. Um, some of these others have, you know, Cisco Umbrella has a huge install base. You can get that feed. Um, these are really good feeds to have. Some of the ones that are a little more niche, you might look at those and say, I want to pull that because my industry vertical suggests I should have it. Um, it right. won't, they won't necessarily apply to everybody, but they're, yeah, you know, go out and see what's available because you will find. Um, absolute gems for your particular install in terms of intelligence feeds, and they're usually free. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's very true. I want to also ask about a, a weird one that's in there, Tom, and it's SI8 uh, spam protection. Spam. Yeah. Um, and I looked at that and I went, okay, this this feels like a bit of a hard fit, like it didn't fit anywhere else. So just thinking of spam protection, um, what unique challenges have we dealt with and how are we actually ensuring a effective spam protection while maintaining system efficiency? Yeah. What's interesting about this control family and, and honestly a bunch of them that start with the word system is they're kind of catch-all control families right and so you're right there are things in here that you have to kind of look sideways at to see how they fit um, spam protection is a little bit of one although if you think about sort of data integrity yeah it does fit um, yeah. spam protection is to me this problem is solved like um, we understand how to deal with spam largely in the in the world and if, if we don't um, you know we're probably not doing our jobs very well. Um, this is not unique to FedRAMP. Um, we happen to be a, a Google Suite user, so we have Google Mail. Google Mail has really good spam built right in, but we can tweak it, and we have tweaked it, um, so we get better results. The As you probably know, Kane, as somebody who's been in this space, every time you tweak a rule, you always risk um, losing good data or good email. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's a sort of an ongoing battle with the rule set. Um, we fight that battle just like any other organization does, but largely we have it tuned to the right place. You know, I, I delete probably 30 what I would call spam a day, but those 30 are really call list or email mailing list mails. Oh, goodness, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Or um, LinkedIn in mails that are from some BDR yeah. or SDR. That's or right. So their services, cold they're, emailing. they're yeah. sort of expected email. Yeah. They're not true spam. Um, but other than that, I don't, I don't see a bunch that come through. So I feel really confident that our, um, our solution works. For other organizations, I'm sure they have spam already in. In fact, you know, you and I have both consulted at hundreds of companies. And when you consult at hundreds of companies, you get a feel that spam has largely been dealt with. Because if it isn't, you have CEOs that are raging mad. So <laughs> this one gets dealt with. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that checks out. Well, I want to ask about one other um, specific control in this control family. And uh, it kind of goes to the, the way that systems get compromised around uh, input validation. So it's control mm -hmm. SI10. And I wanted to ask what it's been like, uh, what, or what the development team's approach has been like to SI10, particularly in terms of validating the integrity of data inputs to prevent security breaches. Yeah, what's interesting about this one to me is Anytime you have a web application, you've largely already thought of what inputs are coming through that I want to expect and what inputs might be put in that I don't want to expect, right? So mm -hmm. in the case of uh, this, we already had the majority of the, the sort of verification error inputs and all that nailed down. So we already know we can't put in strings that aren't expected. Um, those get mm -hmm. just sort of... Uh, um, Circular, circular bin, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Um, so, in terms, what this really is asking is, is if you have a line of input, you know, will it take um, some sort of string that might call an unexpected executable? Will it take some sort of string that might um, cause a buffer overflow? Will it take, um, will it air out your application in such a way where it crashes the overall platform? You know, these are the things you worry about. Right, As or a, like things like a SQL injection attack, oh, for that's example, a great to be able one. to retrie yeah. retrieve the entire contents of a database. That's right. So what uh, most web application developers already have in place is a whole bunch of validation on input long before it ever gets to the point where it could execute, right? We're the same. So we ha the, the big challenge with this is to go back and document what you've put in place. You know, oh, okay. you've probably dealt with developers in your career, Kane. Developers put wonderful intelligence into their code, but they don't always document what they've put into code. So one going of the back best developers I ever worked said, that's why we call it code. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So um, we go back and we, and we have to, you know, basically sit with those folks and, and document exactly what they put into code, um, mm -hmm. put it in some sort of a process, um, our procedure document so we can show it to auditors. And then of course the challenge with FedRAMP is to always pull the evidence for it. So, um, you know, we have to go back and, and find where we can pull evidence of, of that capability. Okay. Oh, okay. So we've, we've already baked that in. Uh, last question on that. Does that also um, 
and I can't remember, does the control include a WAF, a web application firewall, or is that covered down as somewhere else? Because no, often you, we see WAFs as a way of doing input validation. Yeah, I don't believe anywhere you will see the word or the abbreviation WAF in FedRAMP. But I can tell you, if you read all of the controls in FedRAMP and it crosses families, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you'll come to the conclusion what they're really saying is you should have a WAF. <laughs> so so that's um, today we don't. We do it with code. Um, in our in our federal um, you know .gov implementation, we will have a WAF sitting in front of um, the application. And Got it. It'll, okay. it'll do especially a bunch of the pre sort of user input filtering, right? Um, still do the user input filtering, but um, there is a significant risk in web apps of of bots essentially just hammering the front end, mm -hmm. and that's really where WAF comes in um, strong. Cool. All right. Well, with that, I think we've we've covered everything in this one. Let's talk about this beer. Um, Tom, how have you been doing on yours? Because we see how I've, I've been doing on mine. Well, my can, my can is empty. And, okay. uh, oh, oh, and that's I still where got we some. sit. Oh, dear me. So oh, I could make finally make it fit. Hey, there we go. I think I'm like doing I told you, good. I usually, I usually have about the top eighth of an inch of beer. It's <laughs> a legitimate measure, right? Yeah. Oh, the chain, the smell's changed. Um, it's, I got a bit of citrus there, which mm. is unexpected. More than just the grapefruit, but I don't. Uh, I'm still not smelling the bread. See, that's uh, Tom, all you I must smell. have some kind of fancier bread than Wonder Bread. That's got to be it, right? Do they even make Wonder Bread anymore? <laughs> I'm gonna have know. to go check my refrigerator yeah. to be sure. <laughs> but no, I do. I, bread is what I smell when I smell this. I still smell. You know, it's a sweet fruit. Like it's a, definitely something sweet there. I think a plum is what it, what comes to mind, but you know, you could, maybe like you a yellow plum, me. like those Italian ones. Sure, let's go with okay. that. I, I, I was thinking, plum. I was thinking red or purple plums. All right, huh. but it's definitely got a sweet smell to it. I will say this: this variety of <coughs> beer in my world doesn't doesn't sit well um, in terms of like letting it air and and get warmer and all that. These oh, are the kind of beer times. I like to drink quickly. So. All right. Well, I'm going to have another sip just to see if it's changed from a flavor profile. It still has bubbles in, which is fun. Yeah, it tastes like misspent teenage youth. <laughs> yep. Um, you want to review this one first, and then I'll have sure. a go. Or, um, all right. You know, it's it's what I would expect with a beer like this. I've had, like I said, one Japanese locker. The reason I don't have many Japanese lagers is they're all pretty thin and and kind of lack the character that I like in beer. Other people uh -huh. like this. I can uh, think of a couple of my friends that would really enjoy this. So, you know, I'm not going to go out and buy this. I'm certainly not going to stock a Japanese lager in my refrigerator, just like I don't have many American Pilsners floating around either. I usually have one or two for my son's friends, but uh, that's about it. So in terms of beers that I, I'm going to go out and buy and drink and enjoy, you know, I'm not going to do that with this. I'd probably give this a three on a scale oh, of wow. 10. Oh, um, wow. And it isn't because it isn't drinkable. Savage. It's very easy to drink. It's just not enjoyable to me to drink. I want some more hoppy character. I want something that draws my attention and makes me question what it is creating that flavor. This just doesn't have any of that. My goodness. Okay, so we're, we're about to have like uh, history being made on the show here. So um, I like that it doesn't have a lot of character. However, having said that, this is still not the sort of thing that I would go out of my way, that I would go to a store that I would actually think of ordering uh, because my friends bring their own beer and my kids don't like beer, thank goodness yet. I mean, still 18 and 16, so they probably shouldn't. Well, I'm going to tell um, you that they, that they might like beer. You just don't know that yet. <laughs> that is a uh, fair description of my childhood, Tom. Thank you for bringing it back again. Um, I'm going to give this a higher rating, though, than you. You gave this a three. So I'm thinking of the things and the faces that I've made with a, a rating of a three. This is definitely closer to a five for me in that it's not terrible. Um, I wouldn't voluntarily go out of my way to drink it. But if it was between this and... Uh, um, uh, not uh, drinking anything. 
Oh, goodness, no. I was going between this and, like, absolutely drinking nothing. Um, I would drink this. You know, if I was dying of thirst in the desert, this would be a fantastic beverage to have on hand in lieu of water. But um, I'm going to go with a five, which this is interesting. You gave it a three. I gave it a five. There we are. I believe that is the first time you've had a score higher than me. I think that's the first time we've actually flipped. And with that, that's all for today. If you think you know a beer that I'd like, apparently I, uh, I like thin, boring, flavorless dull kind of like me really but if you think you know a beer i'd like or if you have a fed ramp question drop it in the comments below and remember to like our linkedin and youtube pages to hear live interviews with information security professionals with that we're out thanks everybody thank you